I said this, I hope you guys are enjoying this. After working in the shuttle program, getting up here used to require a bunny suit. Yeah. This used to be a bunny suit. Now, when um, <clears throat> active missions and preparations for missions were going on, bunny suits were always required. Up here, yeah. This is a, this, this is, is a, just because now they're retired and yeah, I can fly again. They're still trying to keep it, you know, keep it semi clean because this. Okay. These are going to museum next. And I'll ask you to stay away from the edges. This is a real shot right here. This is only a couple times I've been out here. Can you ask for the airlock? Yeah. Yeah. The cabin airlock. Here's the docking mechanism. And then the EVA hatch is on the other side. Okay. So you can go down there and look down there. Okay. Can I see it? Okay. okay. You'll see it better from inside. Since the last mission is defixing the vehicle to save it, but also trying to restore it back to almost a flight status for, for the museum pieces. The uh, Smithsonian wanted every when they take a uh, artifact, they want it back to as for drawing. So everything is going back for drawing. Now we are making some minor modifications, like we're putting different own spots on because the other own spots are contaminated with hydrazine, not very good for museum pieces. And some of the critical equipment we're taking off and maybe putting on uh, non-flight spares or the simulators. But basically, all three vehicles going into museums are flight ready. doing everything back to pristine status and that gives us the opportunity because even though we're still trying to keep this clean, this is not a clean room environment like it used to be when we had to put payloads in this bay. All the payloads we put in there, most of them were susceptible to dust and hairs, things like the Hubble telescope, everything went up there uh, in mechanism to put any dust in there. <clears throat> now do you have any idea what the next major milestone is going to be for Endeavour? in the transition and retirement process? Well, the next the next major one will be, um, well, there's, there's little minor ones. Putting the uh, ohms pod, the clean ohms pods on, putting the nozzles on the end, and then prepping it for uh, for transport. That'll okay. be the next major milestone. So there's a lot of work, and we call it ready for ferry flight. So the ferry flight milestone will be big. But the little ones before that is, I, I believe the major milestone of these, calling it deservice. service everything that uh, required post-flight is done, now it's just museum preparations. Okay. And making sure that we, when this goes into a museum, you won't see anything that's contaminated with hazardous propellant like hydrogen or ammonia. So a lot of work's been going on to deservice all that. And then taking all the ordnance off of these things. A lot of ordnance has been installed in these vehicles, like uh, explosive bolts to open hatches. There's been explosive bolts, like, for instance, on the uh, KUFN. We got it back to The KUFN is leaning off the side with the gold foil on it. That, that has got explosive bolts on it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't believe it's all been secured yet. That was a major milestone. So, deservicing it and then prep for ferry would be the next major milestone. Discovery, I believe, is there. Discovery's got a jump on it and it's closed up in there. It's already sealed, right? Yeah, so it's already sealed. There's no access to it, not like this. <laughs> then the tail comb is already on it. <laughs> this one, uh, like I said, getting it back into museum shape into regime drawing shape and then tail cone installation ready for third flight. Cool. When the tail they don't shut, they're not hermetically sealed, so to allow the pressure to equalize better, we open vent doors and they're just about Yeah, it was very small, but it's also actually yeah. right. they actually they open they use those on ascent and on return. It's a vent to make sure that the pressure is equalized. Not only in the pillow, but put in those bays on either side to make sure you don't build up any pressure. Because when you come back, you come back in, you have, you have a vacuum. Mm -hmm. and you want things to actually collapse into it. On the way up, you want to vent it so it won't explode out. But you don't want to capture any pressure. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is designed for zero G, mm -hmm. so there's not a whole lot of structure in there. Right. It's designed for, you know, it, it doesn't have the kind of things that keep it from you know, 14.7 psi, right. maybe the deflector, the point. So we use the ventors, and if we got some time, we'll actually I can point them out. Yeah, if yeah. we go downstairs. Yeah. What else you guys want to see? Another stop. We can stop at the nose. Okay. Take a look yep. at the nose. And we'll Let's go do straight. a circle. Yeah, let's go do a circle. Yeah. Okay. Now this whole piece right here is called the Ford RCS. So you can kind of see this comes out as one piece. Now this is full of uh, hazardous propellant all the time too. So this is one of the things we had to clean. These are the thrusters that uh, use the position of orbiter once it's on orbit. So this had to be cleaned and deserviced to make sure it's ready for your museum. Okay. I, just, I don't know if you know, hydrogen is really toxic. Yeah. A small amount of it uh, will poison a lot of people. So 
very careful about that. So this is ready to go. And you can see uh, the business end of the cockpit here. And when you get inside, you can see that the crew cabin is actually two stories. The flight deck up here, and you can see they're entering down here in the mid body. Very good. You can see the special material on the nose. Yeah, and what is that for? RCC, uh, reinforced carbon carbon. It's a very uh, special uh, material that's high heat. And you can see we only put the RCC on the real delicate areas of the shuttle that take the highest heat. These black tiles will take a lot of heat, but this RCC sees the brunt of it. You'll see this on the nose cone and the leading edge of both wings is where we use a different material called RCC. And what's the temperature that it's, it can... It's, it's up to the 4,000 degree Fahrenheit. And it's, it's really hot here. The black tiles can take that same temperature, but I think the nose and the leading edge of the wings take it a lot... Uh, a little bit more and a lot longer. And you see, this 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 Ford RCS looks like it's it's actually cleaned out. This is usually the interface for electronics and all the propellants that we we load it with. So by that being empty, it sounds like maybe this Ford RCS is just a hollow shell right now. Maybe that's how they're shipping it to the museum. Now the high heat area has got the black tiles on Columbia and on uh, Challenger and on Discovery. The white areas actually have white tiles, but the white tiles weigh as much as the dark tiles. So over time, they learn that they can put these kind of, they're not asbestos blankets, but they're a, a material that's uh, high heat uh, sink. And so they found out the blankets are a lot easier. You can put them on by the square foot instead of by the square inch. So you'll see Endeavor being covered with white blankets. Are you planning on going to the museums to visit? Well, uh, I won't make special plans for them. What's that? I won't make special plans. Okay. If I come to the museum here, of course, that'll be part of the ticket. But well, really, uh, um, Smithsonian or with Endeavor in California? No, I probably won't go to New York. I probably won't go to really? California to see it. But if it's a rock operation, I wouldn't mind taking my nieces and nephews to show them what I spent my life career on. Sure. <laughs> but it's just not the same for me. These will be museum pieces as, as opposed to spacecraft. And uh, that doesn't interest me as much. You've probably seen it with engines in. Yeah. It's a little different. Now, any idea when the replica engines will be installed? Oh, they're ready to go right now. Yeah. It's just a nozzle, a flight nozzle on a beam. And so the way it works is the, the nozzle and the whole engine is attached. You see the, the two attached points for the low pressure pumps. One side is oxygen, one side is hydrogen that, that goes to the, to the uh, engine. That big thing in the middle is just a gimbal block, and that's the big structural attachment. But it actually has a, a gimbal in it that allows it to move. The way it moves, you see these two things sticking out. I think we can step down here. Yeah. Let's stay away from that head zone. These two things are the TVC actuators, and they're hydraulic. And as they come in and out, they're attached to the engine, and they make the engine go uh, one way or the other, a uh, rock and roll. So you can maneuver the, uh, the engine anyway. So when you see the engines moving, it's these two pieces that make it happen. In two planes. And you can see, we're uh, just uh, six feet away from the edge. Oh, okay. Sometimes when you're putting cold things, even though we have low humidity, there might be some humidity. Some of the, if they're working with ammonia or something, and there's a lot of hazardous materials in this that actually condenses water and it starts dripping. And see, so this is a special problem we had in the engines. You see a lot of this stuff is insulated. Now, the, these red things are just temporary protection. But under that is vacuum jacketed insulation. And we had to do that because when you have something that's minus 425 degrees Fahrenheit, really cold fuel, not only does water condense out of the air, liquid nitrogen, nitrogen from the air, actually condenses out, it's so cold and liquid nitrogen starts dripping off those things. And liquid nitrogen dripping is, is very toxic, very corrosive. And it's, of course, you don't want it dripping on you, but I mean, either other materials, even metals, it corrodes very quickly. So you worry about liquid nitrogen dripping. So that's why you see such heavy insulation. And that's part of the rocket science, is keeping mm. it. Yeah, I've never, cold. never knew that. Everyone thinks that this is a, a hot engine because when the nozzle's here, 
the nozzle, the, the, the uh, main combustion chamber typically sits right about here. And everyone sees the flame. And it's, you know, 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 6,000 PSI. But everything north of here is freezing cold. To make that fire, we use minus 425 degrees hydrogen and minus 273 degrees oxygen. And you mix that, and that's what releases the energy. But to keep those propellants in liquid form, you have to get that cold. So back in the days, we would see a lot of this because then you'd see air condensing, either moisture or liquid nitrogen, and you always wanted to capture it before it got anything. We wouldn't use a bag for liquid nitrogen. So this must be just from air conditioning yeah. kind of condensation you got different. Mm. Yeah, now that I've looked deeper into the compartment, I can see a couple others down there on the bottom too. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it does feel good, that cold air coming out. Yeah. That cold air is coming from <laughs> somewhere, so it's condensing moisture <laughs> out of the air into somewhere. <laughs> Very cool. But like I said, you can't imagine the hazardous materials. That right. Um, not only the cold temperatures, high pressures, uh, electricity, hydrazine, monomethyl, hydrogen, nitrogen tetroxide. Um, they call it in the APU, so you use uh, unsymmetrical dried hydrazine, which is nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. So it really is, it's this place really dangerous. And on top of that, we purge this with liquid nitrogen or gaseous nitrogen sometimes to make sure you don't get a fire. And of course, that causes, it could cause suffocation. So when you pressurize, you just want to make sure that no one's, you know, around. You know, because even if that, that cold air was nitrogen blown, in fact, that don't want to blow it so this, this, is, this is the connection. We actually use this, this flow right here, kind of this little hole, disconnected to the engine and actually cooled the engine computer. We call it the Space Shuttle Main Engine Controller. It's a big box, about this big. Old fashioned technology. But I mean, that's what we had to work with. And we needed to cool it. And this is what it just, and the pipe came down and just blew on the box to cool it. And when we blew, this was, this was a cold gaseous nitrogen. So if it was blowing nitrogen right now, it would probably pass out. <laughs> so this is really a hazardous area. That's why I took so many special certifications and, and training to make sure you knew what you were stepping on and knew what you, uh, you know, what you, what you avoid. As someone who's been uh, involved with the shuttle program you know, pretty much since the beginning, almost, I guess, yeah, well, not the design, but operation, operational the flights. Operation, yeah. What do you think of the whole um, commercial space taking off with SpaceX and well, Sierra I'm, Nevada and, you know, the other... I'm excited about it. I, but again, I'd like to see the devil's in the details because I want it to be true commercial. I think it should be... I think NASA should take a step back and do it just like they did with the airline industry. It takes the government to set up the business and then the government to back out and let the commercial providers do it. And of course, the government has to stay only involved in regulation and that kind of stuff. But I would like to see them, at NASA, take a step back and stay out of it and truly keep it commercial and have a deal that says, I'll buy a gallon of water from you on orbit mm -hmm. and not have to figure out all the details up till you get there. And that's what a commercial business is. If they turn it into a quasi-commercial where NASA is still involved in every step, it becomes very expensive because the commercial industry can do it a lot cheaper if you let them alone and incentivize them in the right way. Of course, you want to incentivize them to safety. Of course, no one, and that means you got to get that gallon of water on orbit safely and on time and you know in a certain condition. I think we got another group coming. Yeah, they're going down. Oh, okay. So I'm excited about the commercial. I think NASA should do what they're saying and then move on to something else. And I don't that I don't think they're far enough along SLS. And really, I tell you, even if they did have a rocket right now, they don't know where they want to fly it to. I think when you're making plans, you need a destination. And then the design drives you to a rocket. NASA's doing just the opposite. I think they're doing the rocket and then they're deciding a destination. And that's, that's what it I seems think. like. So, but I'm, I'm excited about commercial, and it's about time. Okay. It's about time they did it. In fact, there are you know, several commercial operations going on right now with SpaceX across the river. Boeing is taking over OPF Phase 3. And they're renting that out on a commercial basis. Uh, you know, SpaceX has got a lot of successes. I know they were able to talk NASA into skipping one of their flights to go to the space station. This, this yeah, they've combined uh, missions into one yeah. for this next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of talk. Everyone is rooting for them. 
I saw an article in the newspaper this week with some reporters thought that you know the whole industry was against them. We're all for them. In fact, that they can do it, you know, to, to help everybody out. Yeah. On asset, the three main engines get their fuel from the external tank that basically sits here, and the way that the fluid pumps through these interfaces. And look what hydrogen flows through the that hole from the tank. So to keep it separate, uh, liquid hydrogen comes to that hole at about minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. Liquid oxygen is minus 237 degrees or 273 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's really cold stuff. Now what happens is the, the tank that basically sits right here is actually also attached right here where these uh, jacks are. And so after about eight and a half minutes, when the three main engines got put it in orbit and the engines shut down. The tank, of course, blows uh, explosive bolts, and there's a big explosive bolt up front, separates from the vehicle, and to re-enter, you need a clean, smooth finish. So these doors slam shut. And you can see these little toggles here. Just what they do is, these are spring-loaded, so these are actually just rotate, an electronic motor rotate, free them up, and these two slam shut. And it's important that they form a real good seal. So this is something we, worry, we used to worry about, but uh, this is working first time every time. Uh, you also notice the space shuttle is a strange animal. It's not like a regular airplane. It's got these strange body of these uh, aero surfaces. It's got the elevons and it's got this body flap because it's not like a regular wing that's got flaps and, and rudders. So with this, it, this body flap really changes the attitude of the vehicle and that's how you keep your nose up and also with these elevons basically serve as the forward and aft rudders for it. So uh, in and out of all hydraulically driven, and you can also see the tiles. You can see how the, the heat flow comes across those, and you can also see the real old ones, which are discolored quite a bit, and the relatively newer ones, which have gotten more black color in them, that we've had to replace over time. And to replace them, you can see sometimes you get a little damage, and here's a little damage in the last mission, a little, a little scuffing, yeah. and of course here's some dings where they actually took the top of the tile off oh, wow. and exposed some white. That would have to be repaired before we flew again. Of course, now these going to museums are going to keep them as, as, uh, as we found it on uh, landing. You see how, uh, I don't know if you remember, you got to watch the video of the last uh, landing for Endeavour because it was an accomplishment. And the guy touched it from this side down first. That's what you can see. And I heard something about when they uh, landed that well, they, I don't know the exact statistics because the astronauts, you know, kind of keep track. But this one came down left wheel, and so they decided to keep these tires on going to the museum. So these are the Aslanta tires. And you can see they took a lot of damage. Yes. Now is this the norm? No, this is what I call um, out of family heavy landing, out of family.